Hello and welcome to my channel, I'm Victoria and this weekend I'm talking all about early photography as a part of the CoCovid weekend. CoCovid or CoCovid is a weekend long interactive and educational online conference put on by the CauseTube community here on YouTube. We're doing a ton of informational videos such as this one and a bunch of live events. There's also an interactive ribbon badge game where you can collect this one by sticking around to the end of this video. I've linked the program in the description below so you can see what else is going on this weekend. I, this is part two in a series of four all about early photography for costumers. Although if you're a writer or a historian or genealogist, you're more than welcome here as well as people who are just generally interested in things. Yesterday I talked about daguerreotypes, today it's wet plate collodion, ambrotypes, and tintypes. Tomorrow is going to be cased images, magic lanterns, and more. And Sunday is going to be early paper images. If you are not watching this between July 30th and August 2nd, 2020, and it is the future, which is highly likely, you can watch them all right now. I've put them in a playlist for you. Most of CoCovid's videos are going to be sticking around, so after you watch my videos, go check out that program and go see some more. There's some really interesting ones coming out. I decided to spend this weekend talking about my other main passion in life besides historical costumes, which is historical photography, because using historical images to get inspiration for your clothes that you're constructing is very important. Unless it's pre-1839, then you're out of luck. So let's get down to the history, eh? The daguerreotype rules strong for over a decade. But by 1851, Frederick Scott Archer was making good headway on the wet plate collodion process. In 1854, the ambrotype was released. Not by him, by someone else who named the ambrotype ambrotype, but then changed his middle name to Ambrose to make it sound like it was named after him. It was cheaper easier and more durable than daguerreotype and quickly gained in popularity. The heyday of ambrotypes is about 1854 to 1864. My battery's gonna die. New battery. The images are on glass and so they still came in these nifty little cases which you can learn all about in tomorrow's video. Soon though the new kid on the block, the tintype, came out in 1856 and eclipsed the ambrotype in popularity. Although the ambrotype did stick around for a good while if 10 years is a good while. Both of these processes are pretty much the same. The only difference is that ambrotype is on glass and the tintype is on metal. So I'm gonna be talking about both of them in this video. Collectively, they're known as wet plate collodion. Wet plate collodion is called such because you pour collodion onto a plate and while it's still wet, you photograph, develop, and fix the image. This is, gives you about a 15 minute window depending on the humidity and temperature of where you are at. Sometimes it's a lot shorter, sometimes you can go stretch out a lot longer. But if you stretch out longer, you start to lose quality in the image. The exposure ranges from just a fraction of a second to many minutes. Mine average around seven seconds. I always shoot using natural daylight. A lot of photographers today who practice wet plate use strobes because they can just set the strobes, go, have the same exposure every time and they are blinding and they are quick. I don't think they look as good, but that's just my opinion. People always talk about how no one ever smiled in early photographs because the exposures were so long. Yes, it's hard to hold a natural smile for seconds at a time, but it's also important to think about where society was coming from. Prior to getting your photograph taken, which at this point has only been around for like a couple decades. Prior to this, the only way you could get your image made was by a drawing or a painting. Holding a smile for the length of a painting is pretty difficult. In most paintings of people, people have a straight or neutral face. This style just held over into photography. But it is common and easy to find photographs of people in early photo photography who are smiling or have a hint of a smile. People did it. Just like today, there's different facial expressions that go through popularity in photographs. Not everyone does them, but a lot of people do. But when asked why he always has such a grave face in his photographs, Mark Twain is quoted as saying, I think a photograph is the most important document. 
and there is nothing more damning than to go down in posterity than a silly, foolish smile caught and fixed forever. So if you're only getting one shot at a photograph in your life, potentially, you don't want to have a stupid facial expression. You can't just redo it. People today also like to talk about how back when people used to go get their photo taken, they would get their head clamped into this vice to hold them in place so they couldn't move at all. Head braces that they used were more like a piece of metal shaped like this that would go against the back of your head and kind of just give you something to rest against so that you wouldn't be moving in your image. This reprint of a manual from 1886, which gets a little more into dry plate, but still a lot of the same equipment that they used in wet plate, shows what some of the braces looked like. They're pretty simple, nothing too crazy. Sometimes you can even see them in portraits. Often you'll see the base here sticking out around people's feet, which is pretty fun. As a side note, if anyone has one of these head braces sitting around collecting dust, I would love to put it back into use. So just hit me up if you got one of those. Poses were often also chosen to, to be stabilizing and help people stay still, such as seated in a chair or resting against a strong table. People still did wind up moving in their photographs, which is pretty fun to see. Animals, not that great at standing still, so you can see them moving a lot. Fun fact, the first photograph that is of a person is of someone getting their shoes shined on a busy street. You can't see anyone else in the street except for the person standing still while he's getting his shoes shined because it was like a seven minute exposure or something like that. Everything else moved away. Sometimes mothers would hide under a blanket to hold their child to make the child stay still to be taken in the photograph. But let's get back to the main topic, huh? Ambrotypes versus tintypes and how to tell them apart. Like I said, ambrotypes were shot on glass. They could be shot on clear glass or a colored glass. Wet plate captures images as a negative, but when you back a negative with something that's black, it becomes a positive, which is a pretty cool party trick. So when you shoot on clear glass, the image has to be backed with something so that it shows up as a positive. This could either be done with a piece of fabric or paint or painting the back of the case putting a piece of black paper behind it, lots of different things. The most easy way is to paint onto the back of the glass. This one is a bit deteriorating. Sometimes I would paint directly onto the collodion surface and it would kind of negatively react with the image, which I think is what's going on with this one. His face is kind of getting eaten away. Why would they do this? Well, this leads to one of the very important things to keep in mind when looking at daguerreotypes, tintypes, and ambrotypes. When light goes through a camera lens, it's projected upside down and backwards. Because you're putting the plate directly into the camera and the light is shining through onto it, the image it captures is backwards. If you're shooting on a clear glass plate, you can just flip the glass plate over, paint on that, or put your paper behind it is safer. And then your image of the person is how you're used to looking at them. It's facing the right direction. If it's shot on metal or a daguerreotype, you can't flip it because you wouldn't be able to see through the plate. I think this is an interesting thing to keep in mind because if you're using the images as inspiration for hair or you're like recreating an asymmetrical bodice or something, if you don't know how cameras work and realize that these images are backwards, you might not realize that the part is on the other side, although everyone parted their hair in the middle, so it didn't really matter. But you might not realize that the buttons are on the other side of the jacket. Or if someone has just one earring, it might not be the ear that you think it is. The only thing is though, if you're looking at a reproduction of a photograph, like in a book, you don't know if the person who took that image flipped it when they put it into the book. So it's just something to think about. You'll notice um, like if photographs of buildings, like this daguerreotype I took of the downtown Seattle, it has a building that says mutual life on it and it's backwards. 
in studios, if they had a prop that had writing, they would write it backwards so that in the photograph it would show up facing it the correct way. Ambrotype glass, tin type metal, but not tin. They were actually on an iron plate that had been coated with a black sort of varnish called Japan that made it so that when you shot an image on it, it showed up as a positive. Back when tintypes came out, they were more commonly called Ferrero types, which is iron in Latin, I think. The sling tintype didn't come into use until the 1860s and didn't really come into popularity until the 1880s. People think it comes from tin being cheap and tintypes were cheap, so they were called tin instead of iron. While today it's not possible to buy Japan iron plates like photographers would back when everyone was shooting this process. Today it is possible to buy aluminum plates that you use for trophies. The names are engraved on trophies. So that's what everyone shoots on because you can have ones with black surface. And it's kind of fun because it comes in a variety of colors. So you can shoot on different colors. Personally, I like to Japan my own plates to shoot on. I just like to make things as difficult as possible. Actually, I just like the feel and uh, weight of them more, I like the color a little bit more, and adding that authenticity that no one is going to notice. I like to collect tins that cookies or oatmeal or what have you comes in to Japan on because then when you flip it over, you get the fun surprise of the tin image. They're also no, I can often get them for free because people are throwing them away. So anyone who lives in this area and has awesome tins they want to pass on, they just can't be embossed. So Amber types and early tin types both came in cases like the daguerreotypes. If you're trying to figure out though if you have a tin type or an amber type in your case, there's a couple different ways you can do it. This one, for example, of this lady with her fun little half smile. If you turn it sideways, you can see through her. Her image, they backed maybe with the back of the case painted black to make her a positive. And so when you turn it, you can see through her dark areas and see that her glass, that she's glass, you can see through it, okay? You can just see that she's glass. Same with this boy, you can see if you turn sideways, you can like see through his chair and tell that he is an amber type. Another way to tell, if you can't just tell by looking at it, is that tin types, if they're done on iron, are magnetic. So see, this magnet is sticking to it. With the amber type, it doesn't stick at all. If you're like, is this photograph modern tin type or? The antique tin type. Well, aluminum, not magnetic. Some images are harder to tell, especially if you're not looking at them in person and can't do a magnet test. Luckily, the time range of when amber types and case tin types are around overlaps so much that it's probably not that big of a deal if you can't tell the difference. If you have them out of a case and in your hand, they're quite easy to tell apart. See, this one. It's on glass, you can hold it up, see through it, tap it till it's on glass. This one, obviously on metal, easy to tell. Ambrotypes and tin types are a lot more durable than daguerreotypes. If they're done right, they've been varnished on the top to prevent the silver from tarnishing, and they're okay to handle. Just be careful because, you know, those ambrotypes still are on glass, and if you're like really doing something sharp, you can still scratch the surfaces. All right, so time's gone on now. It's the 1860s, the Civil War is going on. You're a soldier, you're going into battle, not sure you're gonna make it. You want your family to have a memento to remember you by. There's a lot of itinerant photographers out there where the troops are. You can go get your tintype made really easily. You don't wanna get an ambrotype made because you don't wanna mail a delicate piece of glass through the mail home. You don't wanna be lugging around a piece of glass on the battlefield which could easily get broken. So tin types really gained some popularity here. Cases also start to fall out of favor because they're expensive, they're hard to mail, they're just bulky to carry around. 
There's a lot of really famous photographers from the Civil War era. It's really easy to find books of photographs of the Civil War era. Matthew Brady is a super well-known name of a photographer. Usually when I'm telling people that I like to shoot tintypes and they're like, I don't know what that is, I say, I think Civil War era photographs. And then people can usually place that and think of what sort of image it is. Uncased tintypes became super popular. Oftentimes they would come in a paper mat. They could come in an embossed mat, like these couple of ones. Or they could come in a sort of letter pressed gold stamp around them paper. This carte de physique side size was super popular. Often though, you'll find tin types that are loose, like this one that just fell out of her paper backing. She goes in there though. Some of these have advertisements on the back. This one says from Old Shara <laughs> Amber Type and Photographic Gallery. Hartford, Connecticut. Pictures executed in every style of the art and inserted into pins, rings, lockets, and etc. Particular attention paid to copying pictures and satisfaction given. Also a large assortment of cases and frames at the lowest price. Pictures, 10 cents. So by this time, images were a lot cheaper. You could get them put, as he said, into pins, rings, lockets, all kinds of things. They would also reproduce images. So sometimes you'll find a tintype of a daguerreotype or a tintype of a painting or you'll find it a lot later too in paper images where they reproduce a tintype or a daguerreotype or drawing painting on a later photo process because more of the family wants to have this photo of their parent or their grandparent. Keep this in mind if you see an image and you're like, you know, this just doesn't really feel right. There's something that just doesn't look right about it. This clothing style is really of an earlier decade. This person just frankly looks drawn. It could be a reproduction of an earlier print. They also made really, really tiny ones called gems. And sometimes I would mat them. Look at how adorable that is. I really want to recreate a mat for this and shoot tiny photographs again. They had cameras that had multiple lenses so you could get multiple of these on one plate and then you just cut them apart and then you can give them to all your friends. How adorable. Today it's super common to find tintypes just loose on their own because they've fallen out of their paper sleeve, someone's taken them out of the case to repurpose it for something else, someone's taken them out of an album, whatever is the reason. They're pretty cheap, easy to come by, and still a lot of fun. By the late 19th century, tintypes were kind of relegated to carnivals, fairs, and the seaside. More of like a holiday fun nifty trick to do. Sometimes they'd have really silly backgrounds or like different things you could, you know, like scenes you could sit in. This young adult book from 1911 even mentions tintypes. I'm afraid we shall never get a ride in that pretty motor car. And the only one I was ever in was a stationary automobile at the tintype place at the county fair. Tintypes stuck around for a long time. But of course, they were replaced by another process, which we'll talk about on Sunday. But are you ready? For the most important thing you need to keep in mind when looking at early photographs such as daguerreotypes, ambrotypes, and tintypes as a costumer, if you remember one thing, remember this. The way that these processes photograph color and light is different than the way that we are used to in this modern age. When we look at an image from the 20th century in black and white, or a digital image that we convert to black and white, we have a already preconceived notion of how to read what those colors should be if they were in color. This doesn't apply to these early processes. The way that it captures light renders some colors very different than what we're used to. Yellow can turn really dark, 
Red also can turn very dark. Blues can go super light. That morning photo of that widowed, young widowed woman, she might not be a morning. She might be wearing a scarlet red dress. She might be wearing a bright yellow dress. That really pale dress of that, that woman who's in that really pale, almost white dress, it might be the richest blue that you've ever seen. The thing is too, you can't really know without seeing the original dress as well as the photograph. You need to see like the existing garment in the modern day, although the colors could have faded so the colors still probably aren't that accurate, or you have to have a written description of the dress to really know what the colors were like. I'm gonna share a link to an article that has this phenomenon, like a lot of information on this phenomenon, and it has some great examples of photographs taken in wet plate, in color, and modern black and white, so you can see how differently the colors change. They have different fabric types, they have different fabric samples are common of the time period. And you can see how the different patterns play across, they have different threads that are photographed, different thread colors photographed in different processes. It's really quite interesting to see the change. I need to shoot my own examples of this so then I can show you, but check out this article, it's pretty interesting. Miss Philomena, who is a fellow costumer, she has a video where she talks about getting her photo taken in a dress and really shows this color shift well. So I'll link her video as well. That part is at the end of that video. It's pretty interesting to see that shift in the colors. The only couple of examples that I have of this phenomenon are the writing on that sign that says Campton type, which is written backwards in real life is actually a pale yellow, but it photographs quite dark. The other one is this photograph where I'm holding this water bottle, which qu looks quite black, but here it is in real life. This effect can happen to people too. So if someone has a lot of red in their skin, it can cause them to photograph a lot darker than they actually are. If someone has a lot of blue in their skin, it can photograph them a lot lighter. People with freckles really are quite amazing in this process. Blue eyes, can almost disappear and is kind of scary looking. This happens with people's hair too. Blonde hair can often photograph a lot darker. You look at old photographs and you're like, everyone had dark hair back then. But really it's just the way the process photographs and interacts with light. It's pretty amazing. This also has an effect on people's tattoos. Tattoos have a lot of blue in them. And so oftentimes you can have a photo of someone with like, full sleeves and they almost completely disappear in a wet plate photo. A couple more things about daguerreotypes, ambrotypes, and tintypes collectively. It is pretty common for them to be colored on. So I have a couple examples where, where their bows have been colored in. It's really common for cheeks to be tinted red. You could hand color just a little bit of the image or you can do the whole image. I don't have any examples in my own collection of whole images but here's one that I did where I colored in most of the image. Oftentimes too they would paint gold on the images to highlight people's jewelry or buttons on uniforms. There is a theme, a genre, a type of photograph that was popular back then that I really love known as occupationals. These are portraits of people holding their tools of their trade. Often they're sometimes dressed in what they would wear to work, although other times they're wearing their best outfits for their portrait to be made. I think they're really interesting because they can show you some specialized tools that people used in their jobs. It also shows you the different kinds of jobs people had. They're pretty popular to collect, but they're really easy to find images of online. I also recommend the book Working Stiffs, Occupational Portraits in the Age of Tintypes by Michael L. Carl Bach. He has a lot of different occupational portraits of people in all different kinds of careers. There's some fun ones. There's like tobacco workers, carpenters, icemen, uh, roller skater, you know, textile workers, bricklayers, all kinds of stuff. They're fun images to look at, although none of them are dated. 
As a side note, last year I did a series of self-portraits in occupational tintypes of all myself and all the different jobs that I've had in my life. It was a really fun project and I need to go and update it now because I have a couple more jobs to add to the growing list of jobs that I've had. Wet plate photographs in person, especially new ones, are so beautiful. So many photographers that shoot wet plate today, by which I mean there's probably like a few thousand, 10,000 wet platers, I don't know, but so many of them today just do digital reproductions of their prints. They scan them, blow them up, just post them online, create big prints of them. But there's so much to be said about the actual physical image. Yes, unlike modern photographs, these early processes, unlike digital, which is made up of pixels, unlike film, which is made up of grain, they're made up of something so different that the amount of detail you can see is insane. Scan them at a high enough resolution and you can blow up just one little part of the image. You blow it up so big and see everything in them. There is a lot of images within images within images. The detail on these is unbelievable. If you have a really good photograph, you can see so far into it, it's kind of mind blowing. But see these photographs in person? And seeing the sun reflect off the silver, they're gorgeous. A digital reproduction can't hold a candle to it. There's just something about having an image and holding it in your hand that is something that's so valuable and we have lost today. If I've convinced you to use and look at historical images more for your inspiration and costumes, you're wondering where to find them. There's a lot of books about early photography that have some prints in them. There's various books that are collections on, based on different topics of like photographs that are really good of hairstyles, photographs that are really good of clothes in this era that you can get. You can also go look at historical societies. A lot of them have their collections digitized now. And so if you're, spe you're interested in a specific area, like you want to recreate someone in Kansas in the 1880s, go look at Kansas's historical society, or maybe like some county historical societies. You can find a lot of historical images at antique stores or thrift stores or on eBay. Just be really careful on eBay because people are always labeling photographs as something like daguerreotype, tintype, postmortem, rare photograph. And you look at it and you're like, this is clearly not a dead person. And now I don't know if it's a daguerreotype or a tintype and I'm looking for a daguerreotype. Don't trust, don't always trust the listings. There's also modern wet plate photographers who will take historical images and reprint them on wet plate and try to sell them off as historical images. So be careful out there. If you're able to, I highly recommend getting your likeness made sometime. Getting a tintype made is a lot of fun. There's just something so special about going from a metal plate to a photograph of you within like a 15 minute time span. And that photograph, you know, has the potential to last for hundreds of years. It's not always the most forgiving process. Here's my first, first portrait from 10 years ago. Pretty harsh sunlight too. People uh, sometimes get their photos taken and they're like, well yeah, people didn't look really old in the past. It's just partially the photo process. It's a really fun experience though. I'm planning on making a video of photographing myself in my 1850s costume using wet plate maybe in the next month or two. So stick around for that. Tomorrow I'm gonna talk about cases and a lot about how to date some of your images based on those and other things. So stick around for that. Now that I've blathered on long enough about tintypes and amber types and wet plate floating, I'm gonna let you go. I think by this time you have earned your Kokovid badge. 
If you have no idea what I'm talking about, then go check out that COVID program in the description below. Hit subscribe, stick around, let me know, have you ever gotten your tintype made? Do you have a collection of them? Did you find this video interesting? Leave me a comment as well. And I'll see you soon. Bye. What am I talking about next?